Hello everyone and welcome to another high elo game of Age of Empires today. Our poor little idle villager has come down with a slight cold and of course spent the day pampered like a king with lots of hugs, playtime and even Sesame Street. And while he finally, finally peacefully snoozes, we can sit down to watch Draken playing as the Poles in purple take on Baba Oram playing as the Persians in green. Now, while the players heard their herdables explore their immediate and closed off surroundings because we find ourselves today on arena, both if you look at the map itself and if you just uh, read the word there at the bottom of the screen, and while they try to get their butts up to Feudal Age, probably Castle Age as well, ASAP, why don't we take a look at the Civ matchup we'll be watching today because I suspect it's going to be a fun one. The Poles, a civilization that focuses on their cavalry, if you're in the mood for something light, well, pole scout line units come with a small attack bonus against archers and can be upgraded to do trample damage, which can be very, very helpful in the late stage of the game, since poles are one of the only two civs in the game to have their hussars replaced with winged hussars. Why am I laughing? Because these stubborn, stubborn deer. Now, winged hussars are already tankier and stronger than normal hussars, and their attack bonus is against gunpowder units, and also an even bigger attack bonus against monks. Now, if for, you want to forget the appetizer, you want to jump right into the main course, you're in the mood for something a little bit heavier, well, then pole knights and cavaliers can be upgraded to cost a lot less gold, so it does become easier to spam these heavy cavalry units at the later stages of the game, starting in castle, and by the way, when I say they can be upgraded to cost a lot less gold, I mean it from 75 to 30 gold. Now to back up their cavalry units on the battlefield, the Poles can field a pretty cool, unique unit, the Oboch. This is a tanky, well-armored infantry unit whose attack actually reduces both the melee and pierce armor of every unit it attacks with each and every swipe of its massive oversized warhammer. Now to support the production of their gold and food cavalry units, their Oboch, etc., Pole stone miners also generate gold as they work at the quarry at an incredible rate of one gold for every three stone mined. Their farmers have access to a unique structure called the full work, which replaces their mill and automatically adds 8% of uh, the value of a farm seated in its radius. I'm assuming we're going to see a full work at some point, so I'll show you that how that works. And by the way, the full work, unlike the mill, also adds five population space. Now, pole villagers themselves are harder to raid and kill because, like their Viking berserker friends, uh, I guess they would be pen pals, not exactly family members, pole villagers and Viking berserkers, but like their berserker pen pals, starting in Feudal Age, they do regenerate HP. Now, pivoting our eye to the south of the map, where we've got Baba Oram playing as the Persians in green, man oh man, an economic mega powerhouse with a tech tree that is both incredibly strong and diverse. In addition to getting access to every single economic upgrade available in the game, the Persians do start the game with extra food and wood. Their town centers work progressively faster right off the bat, starting in Dark Age, 5% now, all the way up to 20% faster in Imperial, and they can be a pain in the ass to raid because their town centers, take a look at this, come with double the amount of HP uh, compared to a normal town center, which, as we saw recently in the game between Hera and Huang, can lend itself to some fun... Uh, Fun town center drop opportunities. Now, their castles as well make it harder for them to get raided because they can be upgraded to take less bonus damage and fire more powerful bullets instead of arrows. And by the way, when you upgrade from arrow to bullet, it does come with a an attack bonus, rather, against rams and infantry. Now, using their economic advantages, the Persians, like the Poles to the north, also focus primarily on their cavalry. Their nightline units come with an extra attack bonus against archers, and using every single upgrade available from the stable and the blacksmith, the Persians can field not one, but two unique cavalry units. The first needs zero introduction. He has been around, or I should rather say it, has been around since 1998, 1999, whenever Age of Kings first came out. I'm talking about the gray-butted war elephant, an absolute beast of a unit that comes with a powerful attack, a huge amount of hit points, and also does trample damage, but is still both ridiculously expensive and, even with a slight nerf to its speed, still quite slow. Now, the second is the Savar. This is a more recently introduced unique unit, a heavy cavalry unit that replaces the Persian Paladin. <laughs> what am I seeing here? The Savar replaces the Persian Paladin and comes with an additional attack bonus against archers. 
that helps support their cavalry on the field of battle. Persian archers and crossbows can be upgraded to turn them into trash units by making them cost only 60 wood, zero gold. Or if you want to be a little bit more mobile with your archers, you do get Parthian tactics in age earlier as the Persians, so you can research it in Castle Age, not in Imperial. Good time for me to actually have finished <laughs> the Civ introductions, because it looks like our poll wants to make an issue of it. Has he seen that he's laming the stone, by the way? Yeah, he's seen. This is one thing that's incredibly important on Arena is location of resources inside your base in terms of how close they are to the walls. Because when you have a patch like this that's about to get lamed, 80% of it, four out of five patches, are about to get lamed by this one tower, which means that if Baba Oram wants to put some kind of tower defense of his own, he has one patch of stone to mine for the immediate future. Any villagers that try to mine these four, uh, they're going to get hurt. And unfortunately for Baba Oram, and fortunately for Draken, in Arena, the internal of your base, the inside, there's only one stone patch. Now, externally, of course, there is an additional stone and additional gold for everyone. Looks like the gold is here to the left and the stone is here to the right for our uh, poll. And so our poll is uh, making an issue of it. Usually, what the pro players like to do is you see the purple arrow, uh, rather the purple line. This is the line of attack of the tower. Generally, what you want to do is start walling off around it and that way if your opponent ever does bust into the base you are safe and secure from uh, arrow fire and then you can place your tower wherever your opponent uh, makes his move so if draken busts in and places a tower here then baba Ram will know to place his tower in this area if draken places it here he'll know to place it here but for now draken taking a bit more of an in your face approach a bit more of a risky approach by just palisading up behind this uh, these Palisades are not exactly 1,000 HP walls. They can be deleted, destroyed very, very quickly. And here now, the more traditional walling off begins for him as he creates a bit of a ring around the rosy of this tower. And, okay. I was going to say, where are these villagers going? They're going to pivot to attack the gate. So pressure here being put on firmly by the pole. No surprise there. A good strategy when you're playing against the Persians and a good strategy when you're playing as the Poles in general. Draken for him, I'm assuming the name of the game is get your butt up to Castle Age, get that Schlachta privileges and start spamming knights and uh, as soon as you can, Imperial Age Cavaliers while delaying and crippling your opponent's economy and ability to mine stone and putting up a castle, etc., because you are, again, playing against the Persians. Now, the Persians probably one of the most diverse, powerful tech trees in the game. They are just a ridiculously powerful civilization. We'll see. We'll see wh what the game plan is. We'll see if that works out. For now, there's... I mean, why is Purple focusing on this gate when he knows there's a palisade behind it? He can focus on these. There's no counter tower. I wonder why Draken is focusing all of his energy on this gate when there's literally, what is this, 218 HP, another 250... Another one, there's literally like 700 HP standing between him and busting into this base. He has instead chosen to attack the 1650 HP gate. Will any of these villagers die? They are very injured here. Looks like uh, arrows didn't, couldn't make up their mind which villager to attack, so they attacked two of them. I didn't even know that was possible. And out come the villagers again. But I think there's still one in here, yeah. So there's still one villager in the tower. Behind this, our Persian is down four villager count. Both of them have zero military, and it looks like uh, Baba Ram has been locked inside his base, which has given Draken an opportunity. Look how much of the map he's seen in a few short seconds. He'll have seen 100% of the neutral ground, whereas our Persian, oh, this is like a Swiss cheese. There's uh, very little vision here. He's seen one, two, one, two, three relics. Hasn't seen the one to the center. And where is the fifth relic? Right underneath our very nose. So he must have seen that one. Okay, so he's actually seen four relics. It was a little bit hard to see on the minimap right next to that gold patch, but... Okay. <laughs> now, Baba Oram, following the traditional counter to being tower rushed, he rushes his butt up to Castle Age. So I'm assuming he can get a mangonel out. Doesn't have the wood for it. He needs the wood. I'm assuming the second he's got the wood... He, oh, he just bought the wood. Never mind. 
Why did he buy the wood if he's not going to build the mangonel? Now he's out of gold. Oh, because he... <laughs> First he was out of wood, so he bought the wood for the gold. Then he ran out of gold because he bought the wood for the mangonel. And in a short little while, he will, with five villagers, have enough gold to start trading the mangonel. Oh, then never mind. I would be remiss. I got so lost in the sauce here of this uh, pole attack. By the way, our pole is still a minute and a half away from going up to the next stage that I forgot to go over the usual three-part meta of an arena map like this, of an enclosed map, arena, fortress, etc. In stage, there's usually three stages. In the first stage, which we're approaching the end of, both players rush their butts up to Castle Age. Now, why do they rush up their butts up to Castle Age? So that they can start gathering these physics-defying relics, these um, Mjolnir hammers that only monks have... Uh, the ability to carry, I guess, monks and warrior priests, but we're not watching the Armenians, so we're not going to mention them. And then once the players reach Castle Age, Stage 1 is done, Stage 2 begins, they fight over the relics in what usually is a pretty uh, pretty epic battle of micro between the players. So in one second, yeah, we're done Stage 1. Now we're in Stage 2. Both players are in Castle. Extra TC for our pole. Where is he going to place his monastery? Extra TC for him. Not enough wood yet for... Oh, never mind. Not enough wood because he already placed a monastery. So he's got a monastery, two town centers. Our Persian going up to four town centers. And already had his monastery out because remember, he rushed his butt up to Castle Age, whereas our pole sent four villagers. That's a lot of time that they were not gathering resources into the forward position here to uh, build this tower, which... Okay, I missed the beginning of the Mangonel training, but the Mangonel's out. And now all of the aggression from our pole is essentially over. And we have uh, firmly, comfortably entered stage two where they fight over the relics, which is why you'll see bands of roving light cavalry units, scouts, light cav, whatever you please. Maybe a few spearmen here and there. And definitely some monks, although this one not really ready to go and face uh, possible death. Look at Draken, by the way, patrolling one relic, patrolling a second relic patrolling not only one but two this is amazing this is like in baseball when a player gets caught between second and third or first and second and he's running back and forth back and forth back and forth until someone can tag him with a glove a ball in the glove or something okay for now uh okay what was that why did he just delete his own villager maybe he wanted to delete the the palisade but misclicked so a uh, first kill in the game Goes to a suicidal villager. Ooh, Purple has to be careful here. Oh, doesn't really matter if he busts into that palisade anymore because the villager's on this side of the wall off now. And then, by the way, I should mention once stage three is over, once all the relics are gathered, then we enter into the army bashing stages where the players either build massive armies in Castle Age, they begin expanding out onto the map, or they rush up to Imperial and then do that and then build Imperial Age armies and start bashing them one into the other. So the first relic will go to Purple, who with one tower, one tower and then a whole bunch of follow-up light cavalry units. It looks like they're on follow command here as they move like raindrops. Did anyone else, when they were a kid, when they were driving in the car, in the back seat, and it was raining, did they ever race raindrops against one another? Like, you see, you know, you saw two raindrops... Some would form into a blob with another raindrop and then amalgamate. Some would separate. I always race them. Ooh, will the left one or the right one get to the bottom of the window first? Or do I just sound like... Uh... <laughs> I just sound like someone who probably shouldn't have been uh, allowed into a car in the first place. Okay, first actual blood here drawn by our pole. So at the end of the day, at the cost of a tower... And four idle villagers, I mean, he's still in Castle Age. He's down 11 villagers, but he's going to have the upper hand when it comes to relics. And the longer the game goes on, obviously, the more impressive that becomes a second kill here by our pole. He takes the kill lead 2-0. to zero. And by the way, I love, absolutely love, the Draken took the riskiest, furthest relic from his base. And now the other ones are so darn close. I mean, this one is not super duper close, but it's also not super duper far. So he went for the real risky one first. And with that light cap follow up with just five scout cavalry units, including his OG. 
So that's only, what, 4 times 80 food is 320 food. He has secured himself basically all 5 relics. Although I suspect some of that has to do with our Persian just kind of sitting back and building up his economy on a, off the back of 4 town centers. I'm looking at the top of our screens to compare economic upgrades. They are similar and identical, except now, right as I finish that sentence, hand card for our Persian, but in 40 seconds, hand card for our pole as well. And suspecting that his opponent is going to go cavalry on camel comes out for our Persian. This is what I said. This could potentially be a very explosive matchup. Anytime you have the poles, you expect to see a huge amount of cavalry units, whether it's heavy camel, uh, camels, I'm, I'm, my eyes are dictating what my mouth is saying. Whether it's heavy cavalry like the... Pa <laughs> I'm going to slow down. Whether it's heavy cavalry like the Cavalier, or if it's Lakitic Legacy winged hussars that will trample anyone and everyone to their deaths around them, uh, the poles are always fun to watch. And this monk is definitely going to die, but he's bringing the relic ever closer, and it looks like he's already gotten the one over here. So should have four relics. Might have five. Oh, look at that. Uh, why did you stop? Why did you stop? Okay, continues on his merry way. And once this gets picked up and returns safely to the National Museum of uh, of the Persian Empire, or maybe not, uh-oh, uh-oh, scout moving to intercept. Forget the camels. Oh, he engages into the camels instead of the uh, monk. Now stage two of the game is over, and here we go. Stage three is about to begin. The players are out on the map. It is, in fact, our pole who is going up to Imperial first. That full work drop-off ability. So any farm in here in this highlighted square area, 8% of it automatically added to your coffers. And then 92% of it is left on the farm for you to till and, and uh, collect with your spades and your hoes and your buckets. But 8% being added immediately is just a ludicrously powerful bonus for a civilization that already has a massive discount on its heavy cavalry units. Counter Castle going up for our pole. I'm, uh, I, I'm, would be shocked if we don't see Schlachta immediately researched. It is, after all, a Castle Age upgrade. But behind this, our Persian making himself comfortable out on the map. He said, you know what? You get the relics. I'm not going to let this game go long enough for that to be relevant. There it is. Gold cost on the Nightline units has just dropped from 75 to 30. By the way, you guys know I rant and rave about the Yeoman upgrade for the Britons being too expensive. Schlachta is way too cheap. <laughs> it only costs 300 gold. 500 food, 300 gold is not a heavy price to pay when you can start spamming Cavaliers in 22 seconds off the back of how many stables? Nine stables to the five of our Persian. But our Persian will have... Oh, I was going to say it was going to gonna have the stronger unit with the camels, but he's going knights? Why is he going knights? Very interesting. Camel gets that villager. Yep, as she goes... Oh, even the hammer melts. Yikes, okay. Will he return the camel? No, greedy, greedy dragon decides to delete the camel instead of letting it go back to its former masters. Town center being built here. He sniffs it out. He suspects something is being built here. I doesn't sniff, doesn't suspect anything. He's uh, managed to put down an outpost right here, which is giving him a huge amount of vision. And it is safe from that castle, by the way, and cavalier upgrade will complete in 15 seconds. Chemistry. Three archery ranges, okay. So we're gonna get to see hand cannoneers? Hand cannoneers and knights and cavaliers? Are we gonna get to see Savars? I mean, look, the Persian cavalier, technically, with plate barding armor being the third. There's scale, chain, and plate. That's how it goes. SCP. That's how I remember things. The Persians with their plate barding armor will beat out the pole because the pole doesn't uh, have that third armor upgrade. Castle being repaired by seven villagers. Should stay against, should stand against two trebs. Is he going to add a third? Yeah, he's adding a third conscription after that. So these cavaliers are going to be cheap. They're going to be produced faster. 
I like that he has a little bit of vision out on the map with this one house, which our Persian says, you know what? I, I don't even have time to deal with this. And there we go. There's what I thought we were going to go get to see. Heavy Camel Rider upgrade. Five hand cannoneers. So this Persian army is going to pack a punch. And whereas initially green let purple control the map to get the relics, now purple is letting green control and dominate the map. Although the castle is now down. And so he can take a battle here. We've got 25 cavaliers, 12 camels, 11 cavaliers, monks, hand cannoneers. Who will take this first engagement of the game? A random scorpion trying his darndest to work and add a little bit of pack. A little bit of punch, rather. Sorry. Okay, some reinforcing pikemen from the left. Our pole wisely going after the trebs, and he is being allowed to. These trebs are not getting repaired. They're not being defended. And even though he dies in the center, his reinforcements are going to be enough to push the Persian back, I think. Unless the hand cannoneers have something to say about this. We've got a bombard cannon as well. Our Persian is building an army that is going to be incredibly difficult to dislodge from here. And this is where our pole needs quantity, but he's instead going pikemen. Okay. He's adding seven more Cavaliers, his castle is up. I'm surprised we're not seeing any Obux out of him. And by the way, for the Poles, Pikeman is as good as it's going to get. They do not get Halberdiers. But you know what? As a meat shield to let the Cavaliers close on your army, Pikeman, not bad. Now he's building archery ranges? I guess when your opponent goes Camel, ranged units are not a terrible idea. Camel's notoriously terrible armor. Zero base of any kind. And so they are easy pickings for some kind of ranged units. I like what Purple is doing if he's doing it intentionally, which is just keeping a few pikemen running around, trying to trap some of these uh, hand cannoneers to take a little bit of arrow fire, bait them here and there if they can, keeping his army count composition rather a, a secret, a mystery. Purple playing his cards very close to his chest. 35. And he's going to crossbow. He's getting... I mean, is are, I, I get your di you have a discounted... Cavalier, but are these not upgrades that you can use the resources to build and train even more Cavaliers? The stronger units will always go to the Persian in this game. They got the heavy camel. They've got the Savard. You need mass quantity to overwhelm this army. I mean, look at this plus 18 attack bonus against your Cavalier, which not only, again, doesn't come with the last armor upgrade, but is stuck at 140 HP. This is not a uh, Frankish Cavalier. Although they are not that much better. What is it, 144 for the Frank? It's really the Paladin where they shine. And uh-oh. Uh-oh, Castle's in uh, under attack. Do I see villagers repairing? Yes, how many? Uh, only four. And here we go, the pole. 51! That's a good quantity. That can overwhelm this army. Ooh, uh, although maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. 35, 35 camels. Fully upgraded. But you know what? He's mixing in Arbalest, he's mixing in Pikemen, but why are you attacking with one component of your army and not the rest? What are they doing huddled underneath this arch, this gate? You know, the Ar Arc de Triomphe was built because of the Triomphe part. You have to win the battle before you build the Arc. Why are you g gathering your army there and just threw away 10 army supply? Although, does he really give a shit? He's at 200 population and he wants a fight. Or maybe he doesn't. He's certainly not acting like he wants to fight. In come the Persian camels. Let's see what the hell we're working with here. 39 camels, 55 cavaliers, 19 hand cannoneers, 18 arbalests. And I love that our Persian is mixing in these AI confusing siege rams. And our pole is taking the bait. Why are you attacking the rams? Here we go. To the north, the camels are slaughtering everything. To the center, the camels, the hand cannoneers. Why are you chasing the ram? <laughs> no. Our pole army disappears. I mean, I want to say in the blink of an eye, in the blink of many eyes, but man, did he fall for the siege ram bait. Draken chasing with what looked like eight to maybe 10 army count that could have been fighting camels instead was chasing siege rams. And I know the song is called Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls, but in this case, it may just be Don't Go Chasing Siege Rams. Those rams could, would have accomplished nothing with your never-ending spam of Cavaliers. It looks like some camels are peeling off to the north. 
We'll keep an eye on them and see what kind of damage they can do. Camel's notoriously uh, shite at any kind of raiding, unless we're talking about the uh, Hindustani camels that attack faster. But let's see what he can accomplish here. This one's attacking a blacksmith, high value target. So both of the both of these players getting distracted a little bit and attacking things that probably should have been uh, best left unattacked. Here we go. We're gearing up for another battle. Meat shields meet in the center. Hand cannoneers, arbalests. The saving grace for purple here who loses his entire cavalier force yet again in the blink of an eye is that the arbalests fire a little bit faster than the hand cannoneers, but He's not paying attention. There's bombards here, or rather a bombard. It is absolutely wrecking the Arbalest count. It has already killed 12. Castle adding a good amount of DPS yet again, going after the Ram with all of his cavalry units. Okay. Trebs finally moving forward from purple. He remembered, hey, wait a second. I've got three Trebs. Why am I so scared to push out here? Arbalists need to be so careful. The Bombard is... Okay. If I say you need to be careful, then he takes the absolute worst shot he could. Followed by a fantastic second shot. I'm keeping very much an eye on this Bombard cannon. Oh! <laughs> oh! Oh my god. Oh my god, more! Oh my goodness. Our Pole army is now half the size of our Persian the hand cannon here and now our persian is starting to mix in some cavaliers of his own why the hell not throw the kitchen sink at your opponent you know he's you've landed a rib shot he's down on his knees now is the time to knock him out looks like that one camel is still attacking the blacksmith it looks like our pole is happy to let it now the persian is taking a battle underneath the castle the castle is being repaired this time by six villagers but he is very quickly running out of stone, whereas our Persian has enough stone for another castle. The Magno on the left. The Onager cutting down how many? Seven villagers. And now he's mixing in Light Cav. I don't know about the Light Cav here. Maybe if they were all ready. <sighs> Final Treb falls as well. Maybe if those Light Cav were already winged to stars. And now he's chasing the Onager. Oh, goodness gracious. Things are just starting to unravel in a big, big way here for our pole, who is now surrounded with a castle to the north. The Persian, like I mentioned, has enough stone for almost two castles now. And Camel versus Light Cav. We know who wins that battle. Infrastructure starting to get attacked, and it is our Persian who overwhelms our pole. Okay, an interesting, an interesting game. I'm curious to look at the stats, but a, a very interesting game because Purple was very aggressive early on with that tower rush. Although, is it really a rush if he did nothing with the follow-up? Then Green kind of laid back and let Purple take the relics. Then Purple got a little bit too comfortable and let Green take map control with that forward castle, which he eventually did destroy. I wonder why he didn't push out at that point. And especially with the poles, you do not want to let them get four relics. Because again, their, their Cavaliers don't cost 75 gold. They cost 30 gold. And so let's take a look at the stats. 159 Cavaliers, 135 Camel Riders. This shouldn't be very close if they were in a one-on-one -on -one -on -one fight fully upgraded. I'm, I'm assuming at the end of this battle, there'd probably be like 30 or 35, maybe 40 Camels still left. And all the Cavaliers would be dead. PKPM right at the end. PKPM beginning. Interesting. So he was... Uh, Really panicking there at that tower drop, if that's what that was at the 11-minute mark. Economy's not too dissimilar. Relic gold, oh my goodness. I mean, divide this by 30, and you get what? 80? 80 Cavaliers worth of gold. More than 80. I mean, all closer to 90, to be honest. That's ridiculous. More wood for our pole. Literally everything else for our Persian. Three or four extra castles worth of stone. Uh, What is this? About 3,300? more gold so he actually mined almost six thousand more gold but the relic did boost our uh pole numbers here a little bit juice the numbers four thousand extra food and yeah we saw the wood let's see conversions i can't imagine they played too big of a role 
Four out of 281 is not really big. Two out of 208, obviously not big. Seven, four buildings destroyed. Let's take a look at kill count. Our poll, oh my goodness, only managed to kill 173 units. I mean, three of them are villagers, okay? So 170 military to 305. And this is just where the numbers need to be in reverse if you want to win as the polls. Again, you are going quantity. You do not have the quality that you need. You are missing the final armor upgrade. You don't get Paladin. And our Persian could very easily have gone Savar, but why would he? He's got this unit with an 18 attack bonus against Cavaliers. So he doubled down, I think, on the right unit. I love the mixing in of hand cannons. This is just the Persians to a T. Whatever they want, they can do. They're kind of like the Chinese in that regard, with the exception of they don't get discounts on their technologies. What they do get is uh, faster producing town centers. And so they can pump out more villagers to gather more resources more quickly than their opponents. And with 149 villagers, maybe a little bit of overkill compared to 110, he did exactly that. Although if you add back the 43 that Draken uh, lost, he would also be at 153 to actually 152 if you add back the 3 to the 149. So they both actually had very similar economies at the end of the day. I love the use always of the full works, these zones of uh, steroided farms. How many town centers did he have? Four town centers at the end of the day compared to the Persians' four. But again, a very interesting yo-yo game where one player took map control, then the other player took map control, then the other player took map control. And even though the poll did get 2,000 more gold than his opponent, which again, he had enough relic gold to train almost 90 extra cavaliers, I wonder if the engagements here were just uh, not taken as well as they could have been. He was chasing rams for a little bit. I love the addition of the arbalest. Don't get me wrong. The arbalest here, a fantastic, fantastic unit. They don't get hand cannon near the poles, so he couldn't really contest it on a one-to-one -one basis. But with a 10 attack against a uh, camel that only has four armor, six damage per attack, 25 is enough to one-shot a camel. Unfortunately for him, he had the weaker meat shield on the whole. And so the hand cannoneers, how many kills? These guys have been around forever, actually. 75 kills, almost three kills per hand cannoneer. And this is just the fun of Arena. We went through all of the stages. I was a little bit uh, curious to see if uh, our poll would continue with the tower rush. But no, it did not disrupt the three-part meta. They both rushed up to Castle Age as fast as they could. Our Persian hitting it first with our poll hitting Imperial first. Then they fought, kind of fought, but not really over the relics. And then they built their big armies and batted them against each other like a little kid with uh, two action figures, one in each hand, just slamming his hands together, one into the other. And it looks like the hand holding the Persian action figure ultimately overwhelmed the pole, up a 60 total population. And with the army that's here, the oh, these fiery flaming balls are about to head over here and kill four or five more villagers after being repaired. And ultimately, the Persian army proves to be too powerful for the Pole, who had a good quantity of cavaliers. Always love to see Schlachta, and privilege, uh, Schlachta privileges in action. Where When else in a 46-minute game do we get to see 159 cavaliers, if not with Schlachta privileges? But ultimately, it is this army, green-clad as it is, that takes the W. Baba Oram is victorious, but GG to both players. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips and make sure to subscribe and enable notifications so that you're notified of my latest uploads.